Good afternoon and welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provision article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to discuss matters that relate to negotiations, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, to consult with counsel, to discuss other personnel matters that affect one or more specific individuals. All in favor say aye. 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 I guess that's it. Do we, we don't have that second, right? All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, and we'll return at 6 p.m. Welcome to the May 2nd Board of Education meeting. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC-TV, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations and comments outside of the meeting room. We will now stand and repeat the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? A motion we approve the agenda for today. So, uh, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Have Approval it. of the minutes open and closed sessions. You have that written down. Don't. I move we uh, approve the minutes for April 18th open and closed sessions. Second. We have 11, two. We're doing Not separate. We do them separate. We're going to do those separate. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it was yeah. April 11th. I'm sorry. These it was are April, April 11th. 18th are the separate. Yes, okay. yes. sorry. So Corrected. April 11th. Yes, I open and closed. Okay. May have a motion to approve the open and closed minutes <clears throat> from the April 11th meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. I now motion to approve the April 18th closed minutes from 9 a.m. Second. Second. Somebody second. 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 I, I, I thought we didn't have to do this. I thought we were just nine and one. Just doing open session. Oh yeah. Oh, just the open okay. session. Yeah. Then I move that we approve the open session minutes for April 18th. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. At this time, we're going to go to the recognitions. Um, Dr. Keene. I am happy to present recognitions. We have quite a few. We have two schools today, so I hope you packed your lunch. <laughs> Let's move forward. Right, so we're going to start with our Energizer Bunny. So I'm going to ask Chip and Wayne to please come forward. The Energizer Bunny recipient tonight goes to Miss Andrea Schulte. Is she here tonight? You have a fabulous name. <laughs> Ms. Schulte's energy is evidently virtually, is, uh, virtually everywhere within Kent Island High School. Her students' artwork fills our halls, display cases, and now even significantly improving the appearance of the bathrooms. Ms. Schulte leads the photography club, the art club, destination imagination teams, and new this year, We the People. 
Uh, the We The People Club will host an event later this month. I believe it is on uh, the 17th of the month. And they're having a dinner. It's an exciting time and hope that everybody can come on out. Ken Island High School is expecting nearly 100 people to attend that event and celebrate and understand the importance of diversity within the community. Ms. Schulte simply never stops and her contributions to the school are appreciated by all of the students and colleagues. Ms. Schulte is the perfect person to receive the Energizer Bunny Award. Congratulations. Right, the Queen Anne's County Hero Award recipient, and that goes to Journey Taylor. Is Journey here? Okay, excellent. Journey is truly a hero at Ken Island High School. Journey's involvement within the school is difficult to summarize. She's an active member of the symphonic and marching bands, which earned her places within all shore and all state bands. Journey has been a cheerleader and has participated in multiple summer theater camps. Journey's volunteerism is truly exceptional and her passion for Special Olympics is most impressive. Journey participates with Ken Island High School's unified tennis, weight conditioning, and bocce ball teams. In addition, Journey serves as an intern with Mr. Hushin's class. Journey's positivity and unselfish nature serve as an inspiration to everyone at Ken Island High School. Journey is indeed a hero. And Journey, who's here with you tonight? Okay, why don't we have your family come forward and, and take a photo with you. So who is this, mom? Mom and grandma. Mom and grandma, come on up. For you. So this is for you. And you've got a, a medal. I won't put it around your neck. And okay, congratulations, yeah. Journey. Our Difference Maker Award recipient is Miss Melissa Osborne. Miss Osborne, please come forward. Miss Osborne joined Kitt Island High School staff three years ago and was impressive from day one. As a 2009 Kent Island High School alumni, she joined the school's counseling department and now serves as a very talented department chair. Miss Osborne keeps Kent Island High School on the forefront of her out-of-the-box thinking and true dedication to the school. In addition to her counseling responsibilities, Ms. Osborne serves as one of the girls basketball, uh, basketball assistant coaches and she volunteers with the softball teams. Busy lady. Later this month, Ms. Osborne will be inducted into the first class of the Ken Island High School's Athletic Hall of Fame due to her accomplishments as a high school athlete in soccer, 
basketball, and softball. Ken Island High School helped raise her, and now she helps to lead Ken Island High School. Ms. Osborne is truly a difference maker with Ken Island High School. Congratulations. Do you have someone here tonight? Just Ken Island High School, my stand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The Spirit Award recipient goes to Mr. Dan Hushin. Please come forward, Mr. Hushin. I knew this was going to happen to you. Mr. Hushin is one of our first year teachers. Mr. Hushin joined Kent Island High School staff this year after relocating from Pennsylvania. Mr. Hushin's tremendously positive personality was quickly recognized and has proven to be contagious. Mr. Hushin works with the special education department and has formed incredibly strong and trusting relationships with his students and colleagues. Mr. Hushin is currently the head coach of the girls. I'm sorry, must I say that? Okay, currently the head coach of the girls lacrosse team and coach the corollary weightlifting team this winter. Mr. Hushin's daily work ethic and positivity embody the spirit of Kent Island High School. Mr. Hushin's spirit is incredible and deeply appreciated. All of these accolades make Mr. Hushin the perfect choice for the Spirit Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Our Shining Star Award recipient goes to Miss Tracy Nicholson. Please come forward. In addition to all of the amazing lessons and experiences that Ms. Nicholson provides for her students within our Spanish classes, she leads the Student Government Association and all of the related activities. Ms. Nicholson has mastered the art of organizing Ken Island High School annual homecoming week. The planning for this week is nearly year round. From Spirit Week to the pep rally to the parade to the festivities surrounding the football game and the homecoming dance, Ms. Nicholson is behind it all. Her ability to work with the SGA leaders throughout the year is amazing, as is her ability to maintain a very active school website. Ms. Nicholson serves as Ken Island High School's webmaster and is always looking for ways to stay current and informative. Ms. Nicholson's work impacts thousands each year and is truly appreciated. Ms. Nicholson is Ken Island High School's shining star. Congratulations. <laughs> to Quint, uh, Kent, um, Queen Anne's County High School, and the Energizer Bunny Award recipient goes to Mr. Ron Frederick. Mr. Frederick, please come forward. <laughs> 
Mr. Frederick is a dedicated, industrious staff member at Queen Anne's County High School. He tirelessly contributes to numerous events, including, but not limited to, graduation, prom, and homecoming. Whenever Mr. Frederick is asked to pitch in, he's readily available to assist without hesitation. Whether building picnic tables, chairs, or sheds, I saw one of your sheds, didn't I? <laughs> His commitment to the school and community is evident. His energetic and positive personality makes him an admired teacher by his students. On multiple occasions, students have been heard stating that Fred's class is one of their favorite to attend. Did they really call you Fred or they call you Mr. Frederick? They call me Mr. Frederick. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> his enthusiastic support of this school makes Mr. Frederick the perfect Energizer Bunny. Congratulations. Well, come on up, Miss <laughs> Frederick. Queen's gonna And your principal was here, I know. Miss Kudak. Oh, there she is. Queen Anne's County Hero Award recipient is Hunter Skelar. Sheeler, thank you. Hunter Sheeler, please come forward. Andrea Gerard nominated Hunter Sheeler for the Hero Award. She was impressed by Hunter's willingness to help his peers. Hunter seems to have limitless patience working with students who are struggling. Even peers who are difficult to get along with, Hunter is ever willing to do what he can for them, even when it means that he'll have to do his own work outside of school hours. Hunter is also a role model in the behavior support program. We should expect great things from this young man in his future endeavors. Hunter is a true hero. Congratulations, Hunter. Our Difference Maker Award recipient is Miss Brittany Kilner. Miss Kilner, please come forward. Is Miss Kilner here tonight? Not able to make it, I'll read for you what's been said about Miss Kilner. Miss Brittany Kilner is a difference maker at Queen Anne's County High School. While all of the teachers strive to make a difference in the lives of their students and the greater community, Mrs. Kilner really takes this to another level. Over the course of just this year, she's brilliantly and efficiently managed a couple of their most challenging classes in her usual structured and highly effective way. In addition, as our primary bridge project monitor, she's overseen the completion of over 40 government bridge projects for 25 seniors all on her own time. That's after school and on Saturdays. In the words of one of her students, I pretty much just come to school for Miss Kilner's class. <laughs> she explains stuff more and waits to make sure we understand. She has a great sense of humor and I have my best grades in her class. Mrs. Kilner is truly a Queen Anne's County High School difference maker. Let's give a round of applause to Mrs. Kilner. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, the shining, um, let's see, yes, the shining star award recipient is Mr. Brian Stokes. Mr. Stokes, come forward. Is Mr. Stokes here? No, okay. So let me share what was said about Mr. Stokes. Mr. Brian Stokes has been a wonderful addition to Queen Anne's County High School. During the recent Agriculture Week, he initiated numerous events that exemplify the farming community. His students were engaged and enthusiastic, introducing the agriculture program to the staff and the student population. Mr. Stokes continues to work with the local Future Farmers of America chapters, inspiring his students to reach the national competitions. As the agriculture teacher, he's diligently working with other CTE programs to renovate the barn on campus so that hands-on experience with livestock can be embedded into the program. Mr. Stokes' ideas and concepts will undoubtedly continue to benefit the agriculture curriculum at Queen Anne's County High School. He is truly a shining star in the eyes of his students and co-workers. Let's give a round of applause to Mr. Stokes. And last but most certainly not least, the Spirit Award recipient, Ms. Stephanie Zeiler. Please come forward. Ms. Stephanie Zeiler is one of the most spirited employees at Queen Anne's County High School. Her constant support in many areas includes being an advocate for mental health by launching her tile project as well, initiating the painting of our school bathrooms with inspirational quotes. And by the way, if you have not seen them, you have got to see them. It is absolutely wonderful. Both projects have a positive effect on the mental well-being of others at Queen Anne's County High School. Her support is limitless, whether through coaching, monitoring sports activities, or attending school events. She also made valuable contributions during homecoming week. I might also add that her leadership regarding the superintendent's art gallery is highly valued. I added that part. <laughs> it's highly valued and greatly appreciated. Her enthusiasm is unsurpassed and contagious to those around her. Keep up the great spirit, Ms. Zeiler. Congratulations. <laughs> At this time, we'll move on to uh, community involvement. Dr. King, would you like to share your events uh, for the past month? Absolutely. I've got a few events, and I've got some um, upcoming events that I would like to share. So uh, mid-April, around April the 19th, the state had a school safety mm -hmm. summit, um, and there were several different um, uh, personnel from all of the school districts across the state as well as uh, law enforcement and some of our political leaders. At that same summit, um, Governor Hogan came and he gave a citation to the SRO who was instrumental in what happened over at the school in St. Mary's County. So that was a, a great mills. I was very glad to be there, got a lot of great information and also uh, Bev Kelly was there as well. 
on the 20th, I was able to attend the economic development breakfast over at uh, Chesapeake, and lots of our community uh, leaders and business leaders were there, so it was a great time to um, to do some networking, and we heard a wonderful um, talk by Dr. Landgraf, the um, president over at Washington College. We also had a fabulous time at the Maryland um, Ben Carson Scholars. We had several of our students there, and I'd like to add that our very own Grace Park, she was recognized for being a six-time winner. So congratulations to her. Of course, we had the budget hearings on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, and then just this past Sunday on the 28th, attended the NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet, and that was a very wonderful um, scholarship fundraiser. So looking forward to our students being recipients of those funds. Right now, everybody may be aware, at least if you have children in grades three through 11, that park testing is happening right now. Um, we already mentioned the We the People dinner that's coming up on May the 17th. Um, the climate survey that is provided to us from Maryland State Department of Education will be administered to students in grades five through 11, um, right after park assessments, but by June 15th. Those, uh, that, that survey will be somewhere in the area of about 20 minutes and questions will be asked of students that have to do with teacher-student relationships, engagement, school environment, safety, those types of things. Also a reminder of the 31st annual golf tournament will be at Queenstown Harbor Golf Links on May 4th starting at 11.30, and a very special time next week where we will celebrate our teachers. It is Teacher Appreciation Week next week, and we are so looking forward to giving thanks to our teachers and showing them how much we appreciate them. And that does it. Uh, the executive team. Madam President, just a, a few items. Uh, number one, on April 19th, I had the honor to represent uh, Dr. Kane at the Ken Island High School baseball matchup between Ken Island and Easton, uh, in which we had a very special guest, which was uh, Comptroller uh, Peter Francho, along with uh, Senator Steve Hershey and Delegate Steve Ahrens. Um, uh, April 20th, as you all know, was our Teacher of the Year Gala, uh, which many of us attended, which is a phenomenal night uh, to recognize uh, not only our, our leaders, uh, employees, um, but all the, the great work that our teachers do each and every day. Uh, attended the budget hearings along with the superintendent in support. And uh, very special this Friday, I'll be representing Dr. Kane at the Fire Academy, which is uh, just right outside here of Centerville. Uh, to meet with our school counselors to learn uh, about one of the phenomenal programs that our kids have the opportunity to uh, attend uh, right in our backyard. And yeah. our teacher of the year is Miss Rhonda Moore. So if you've not seen that on the website, please check it out. Miss Rhonda Moore, teacher of the year for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, okay, at this time we will move on to the student board um, reports. Um, Sarah? The class of 2020 will host an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast on Saturday, May 5th from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the cafeteria at Queen Anne's County High School, followed immediately by a car wash from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the school parking lot. The juniors and seniors of Queen Anne's County High School have the opportunity to attend a mock car crash dramatization assembly on May 4th, 2018 as a part of the prom promise. We are in need of assistance with the prom this year. Um, on Saturday, May 19th, we are looking for donations and volunteers to set up and take down the decorations. Monetary donations are also greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for your help. Our baseball and softball teams won their games Monday against North Dorchester, and men's tennis won their match against Colonel Richardson as well. Keep up the good work. This will be my final board report as student member of the board for Queen Anne's County High School. It's been such an honor to serve in this position. Thank you so much to Amy Hudock for appointing me as student member. I've learned so much from the men and women on the Board of Education, and I can't wait to take these skills with me to college in Richmond, Virginia in the fall. Thank you. Hey, sir. And also, we'd like to note that Ariel Miles, is that how you pronounce Ariel? I think so. mm -hmm. uh, will be the 2019 2020 student board member from Queen Anne's County High School. Um, Grace is not here. She is attending her and her, um, the new member, Marissa Tetti. 
from Kent Island High from, School. Yes, mm -hmm. will um, they're um, at their senior awards night for tennis, but she has a report, so I will read that. Um, on May 2nd, 7 p.m., Music Showcase will select musical groups. May 7th, the Spanish National Honor Society is holding its induction ceremony for new members. May 9th is a band concert. May 12th, Ken Island High School is holding its first ever Athletic Hall of Fame ceremony. May 16th is the Dance Showcase. May 23rd, the Superintendent's Art Gallery and Performing Arts Recognition. And May 31st, seniors will graduate from Ken Island High School. And at this time, I will turn it over to Sharon. All right, it's time for community participation. We ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Peace speakers should sign up on the roster, including their telephone number and address, and please state that in your um, presentation. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. Comments any longer than two minutes should be submitted in writing. There will be no deferral of your time to other members of the community who wish to speak. You get two minutes. Anything else needs to be presented in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels this is not the proper avenue to address specific oh, I'm sorry citizens participation is not intended to be a question and answer session if you have specific questions the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date the board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from name calling citizens and name calling when offering your critique and the first person that we have signed up is Glenn Frost mr. Frost are you here um, if he comes back we'll move back to him but we're going to move forward to mr. Richard McNeil Good evening. Good evening. My name is Richard McNeil, and uh, I'm here tonight as a citizen and as a president of the retired group. Uh, tonight, I'd like to highlight the uh, activities of the Queen Anne's County High School Band when they were in Florida. Um, they did a phenomenal job down there, and it's my understanding that when they performed at 11 o'clock, they had the largest crowd there in the history of this organization for that. And a lot of those were our uh, parents who were down there, but also a lot of our retired educators, we let them know that Queen Anne's was down there and they took the trip to Orlando to support that. Um, they were also honored in the parade as the only marching band parade in that, uh, in that whole uh, setup for the, for the Orlando and uh, Walt Disney Parade thing. So they were honored for that. Uh, they have their concert tomorrow night if you want to hear uh, the band and its concert form uh, tomorrow night at 7.30. So I just put that out there for that. Um, we have been collecting applications for scholarships for our retired educators. They are in now. We will start evaluating them. These are for students who are uh, pursuing a educational degree uh, <coughs> after high school. So we're looking forward to being able to do that. Um, in my mentoring of teachers, I happened to be in uh, three AP classes yesterday, and I just want to say that those particular classes that I ran, the teachers and the students were really prepped for the AP exams, which are going on now this week and next week. So I, I appreciate seeing the uh, hard work that they're doing, and as I said, the students were very upbeat, they were very positive about things, and seemed well prepared. Um, I also monitor the life skill program and uh, that we've been using for uh, uh, Mr. Page. Uh, I'd just like to point out that from my perspective, it's a good uh, engagement of students in the content. Uh, the, the way the program is run, it gets the students involved in the discussions and gets them to think about some of the topics that are so important uh, in this day and age for good decisions. And I just think it's uh, very much worthwhile. 
Um, of the first year teachers that I work with, um, they are, uh, and, and I'm sure Dr. Kane and, and Mr. Pileski are well aware, they are a little bit of anxious about <laughs> this uh, park test. And it's, I've been trying to uh, convince them that they've done their preparations. And now it's up to the students to do theirs and uh, to kind of bring that down. So uh, it's one of those necessary evils in education that we go through. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McNeil. The next person on the list is Caroline Norman. Caroline Norman. Next, Lisa Heath. Um, I'm going to try really hard to stay within the guidelines that are set. Um, I would like to comment on the appeals and hearings policy that the county has. I've been through the website, I've been through the parent handbook. Um, there are several confusing and miscommunications that I've found that are not clear to parents. It's not fair to parents to be able to advocate for their children in a timely manner um, based on the information that we're provided from the county. It also seems as though there's a lack of understanding from our school leadership. Um, I was given information to try and start an appeal and it clearly states in the policies and procedures that are on that board over there, or on the table over there, that email is not uh, a correct form of starting an appeal. So even within what I was given as advice from our leadership as to how to get things started to um, appeal a recent decision involving my son, um, those, those policies and procedures that I was given from leadership were incorrect based on your own policies in the appeals and hearings procedures. Um, I, I'm really frustrated and extremely emotional about the whole thing. Um, and again, we'll try to not do any name calling. Um, our school system is not set up. I know that that several school systems run the same way, but our school system policies are not set up for parents to be able to advocate for their children in a timely manner. Um, it clearly states on page two, item 3B, that emails are not accepted, and that's what I was told to do. Um, in why isn't the rules and procedures of the appeals and hearings available to the general public? It is not on the website. Everything else is hyperlinked. That one particular section is not, so it's not available to the general public. <clears throat> in the parent handbook, there's one section about discipline actions and how to appeal those discipline actions, but my kid did nothing wrong. So he did not have a discipline action against him. It was something else. Um, so I'm really confused by that. There's also a form that's referenced in that specific rules of procedure and appeals that is not located anywhere. So where do we find that form to be able to actually do the process? Thank you. Bobby Bell. Uh, I was deferring if she needed okay. more time. Okay. Okay. Um, Steve Mirak. Thank you. Uh, board members, I respectfully ask that you review the facts related to the incident that took place on April the 13th. Uh, the facts related to the incident are uh, took uh, planned and spearheaded by two varsity players in the JV locker room at 2:45. The incident transpired thereafter. My perspective is at no time did I or other JB parents feel that the JB team would be held accountable for the action of varsity players that conspired to perform this assault. JB coaches have full-time jobs and arrive at Canaan High School as soon as possible daily, which is just prior to practice at 3.30. Uh, some of my questions and concerns are, uh, based on the Q uh, Queen Anne County Public School Code, who is responsible for monitoring these boys after school and prior to team practices? This incident would not have taken place if the school ensured that athletes are supervised and protected from varsity players' hazing efforts. Why are the victims, the JV team as a whole, being penalized for actions that varsity players planned and acted on? Uh, why was the JV head coach disciplined and responsible for actions that took place? He is scheduled to arrive at Kenton High School daily before their 3.30 practice and was not able to monitor the actions of varsity players before his arrival. Uh, QAC administration made a disciplinary decision to end the JV season implicated that JV was solely responsible for this incident. This perception was further reinforced by Kenan High School and Queen Anne's County actions communicating this decision 
and assessment of guilt via broadcast telephone, email, and public announcements. These actions imply the JV team was the primary aggressor and colluded plan this attack. Therefore, they are now identified as guilty by association due to your disciplinary action, which directly affects their character and reputation. Uh, request, uh, reinstate Coach CJ and allow the uh, JV the opportunity to play the rest of the season with the varsity team. Clear the names of JV players that had to endure actions perpetrated by individuals that were not part of the team or authorized to enter the JV locker room. I ask you to communicate a clarifying statement to inform the public of the fact that JV team did not conspire to and lead in efforts relating to the incident that took place on April 13th. Uh, discipline the boys responsible for the attack and clear the names of the young men on the team that were subjected to peer pressure and bullying. Provide appropriate supervision of students within a high school. Mr. Merrick, you're going to have to wrap, wrap up Thank your you. two minutes up. Thank you. Mr. Merrick, would you like to leave your written statement with us? You're welcome to do so. You. Okay, you can hand it Give to it Mr. Pender. Pender. And Chris Haley. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, one thing I'd like to, to ask before we start is I called here and I, they said we'd have three minutes and we would be able to defer. The website says three minutes. When I called here, they said three minutes, and we'd be able to defer. Um, just if, if that's the case, just make that apparent. Make it on your website. Make sure that everybody knows that so we don't come in thinking we have the ability to defer and three minutes. Um, now we have two and no ability to defer. So, so that, that's one thing I would ask going forward that I think would be beneficial to change. Um, my son attends Kent Island High School. Uh, he's a straight-A student. Uh, recipient of a coach's award in basketball that's given to the, the, the player that most exemplifies how you should treat your teammates and how you should carry yourself. Um, I'm here because he is being unfairly penalized along with other innocent students. And, um, you know, there's an incident that occurred. I'll try not to get into any specifics, but, but, but you know, the county fell well short of, of what they were supposed to do with providing a safe and nurturing environment. Um, the, the students had no supervision, schedule, or accountability um, prior to their cross practice. Uh, although this oversight and supervision by the county allowed these events to occur, it is clear that offending students should be penalized for their actions. However, probably even more important than that is to ensure that, that innocent children aren't penalized. That's exactly what the case is here with my son. I, I, I've got a quote here. I've identified, I have not identified your son as being an active participant or a passive participant to what occurred on 13 April or anything that has occurred in the hallways the previous days. Um, but investigations continue and they will continue until the end <coughs> of the cross season. And it is completely frustrating that, that that this should take several days to investigate, but it is clearly uh, an intent to prevent, to penalize innocent people. And the casual indifference that I'm getting from, from, from everyone I've talked to is frustrating. I've recently contacted the county commissioners, Andy Harris's office, the governor's office, uh, I'll be requesting an audit due to the poor way that this has been handled, the lackadaisical and confusing communication with concerned parents, and the casual indifference to punishing inno innocent children. Uh, the I'm ask let him go on is to allow innocent children to finish their season on varsity lacrosse. And that's it. And I think you have the power to, to counsel the superintendent and the administration on that and so 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 that's the ask thank you for your time thank you for your service to the community thank, thank you. you terry haley she's going to defer her time to me until i found out when i got here that you couldn't do that okay thank you yes, is there any additional comments on your um, paperwork that you would like to turn into our secretary Sure, I'll, sure. I'll, uh, not right now because okay. i got notes and everything all sure. over it. Sure, no problem. I can't read it, but, but no problem. I, I will provide you a statement of exactly what I intended to say today, but was not given enough time. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
At this time, we'll move on to Dr. King's presentations. Okay, so our first presentation is on the work of the curriculum management audit and members of our innovation center teams are going to provide updates. As you know, there are five um, teams having to do with organizational effectiveness, early learning and school readiness, curriculum and instructional tools and assessments, leadership and professional development, and monitoring progress mm -hmm. and performance. So we have members of our team coming forward. Is it all you, Mr. P? No, there. <clears throat> I'm just, oh, okay. okay. just going to get the party started. <laughs> Madam President, Members of the Board of Education, uh, Dr. Kane. For the record, my name is Greg Paluski. I'm the Assistant Superintendent. And it is my honor to share with you progress that we've made uh, relative to the curriculum management audit. So the purpose of tonight, if you recall, uh, number one is to provide you with an update. Uh, Dr. Kane outlined our five teams uh, that you recall um, based upon the audit. And the whole Innovation Center, which is what we call, which is our response to it, uh, are multiple, the five teams which are organized into project managers and process managers are the leaders of those teams, which carry out deliverables identified through the curriculum management audit uh, and progress towards system improvement. So very, very shortly, each one of those uh, teams is going to uh, share with you an update. If you recall, uh, just for the public, back in uh, the spring of 2016, we had under, uh, the system had gone through a curriculum management audit, a comprehensive audit, which really looks at five key drivers of system improvement. Uh, and functionality to long-term success of the school system. Number one, governance and leadership. Number two, the objectivity standard, which really looks at the curriculum, the quality of the curriculum. Standard three, uh, which is the equity standard, how well students are moving as they enter our school system until they exit. The fourth, which is the assessment, how well we're monitoring the progress of children and making adjustments. And standard five, which is the productivity standard, which is how well we're using our resources to the bottom line of improving student learning. That said, uh, the audit that was delivered in July of 2016, uh, over 265 pages, which outlined numerous uh, actions. And so what you're going to see is an update from the fall. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the implementation of the deliverables is a three to five year process to implement and a five to ten year process to institutionalize. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to each one of our innovation teams that will introduce themselves and the work that they've that they've been doing. Good evening. I'm Dan Harding, assistant principal at Kent Island High School. Uh, Scott was unable to make it, so I'll walk through our presentation. As Mr. Pluski mentioned, there was a action plan that Team 1 has worked on a set of deliverables. Uh, we presented a a few board meetings ago and we've we've continued to progress along a strategic plan really looking at creating uh, and, we're, and we're getting in as we'll see we're getting into the the final pieces of before I think we present um, to the executive oversight committee um, really the the next step so that's what we'll get into right now the draft policy is is still the same draft policy that we presented last time so I, I won't waste anybody's time going over that but the rough draft of the five-year plan whoops That should be hyperlinked, so. There we go. There we go. So when this comes up, you'll see a, a Google document that begins to put language around what a strategic plan would look like. Um, and as soon as it comes up here, oh, let me do a little work here. Wow. <laughs> All right. Susan, if I knew your password, I would just put it in, but I don't. Yeah, this probably violates something. Okay, so really the overall look of this would be a um, interactive 
website or in addition to our website most likely that would allow the viewer uh, whether it be any stakeholder within Queen Anne's County Public Schools or uh, neighboring areas to really get get into um, kind of what we do so we've outlined and we still need uh, some wordsmithing with this but the mission the vision and core values are there so explaining who we are an overview would uh, be there as well um, our progress towards student success college and career readiness but then when you get into, we have indicators, uh, which we have sent out and continue to send out feedback uh, from supervisors and uh, administrators to, to, continue to, give us, to continue to give us feedback on these following indicators. And it would be our learning accountability and results, our operational effectiveness, our human capital, and our community partnerships and engagement. Under each one, and again, this is, this is a, uh, a Google sheet that we're just trying to represent what a website may look like. Um, under each one are going to be objectives and they're going to be leveled strategies so as a parent uh, of four kids within Queen Anne's County Public Schools I would be interested in evidence of learning I could click on that I have one elementary school and three middle school and so perhaps the level strategies would be very similar or the same for certain things but perhaps and, and I would say there would be varied strategies within each uh, level Within elementary, it would also be varied from pre-K to fifth grade as well. So that's kind of what it would look like. Um, we've seen um, some school systems, uh, as we're not really trying to recreate the wheel, we've seen some very good local school systems that have this, maybe not quite as we are looking to put in a place, but where as a stakeholder, you can dive into the data um, and, and really get from how often buses are uh, serviced to how well our students are um, learning, the diversity of our workforce, our retention rates, things like that. And that, that strategic goal is there for all stakeholders to see. And our goal uh, within Team 1 is to present that information uh, to uh, really the county and, and beyond, I guess. Anybody have any questions? <coughs> all right. Thank you. Good job, Dan. I will sign out. Of that. All right. All right. So good evening. We, uh, my name is Susan Walbert, and here with me is Becky Tudman. Um, I'm the project manager for Team 2, Early Learning and School Readiness, and Becky is the most valuable player, the, the process manager. Um, we're going to talk to you tonight about our deliverables. We, um, in, the, in the Early Learning and School Readiness, we, we, we quickly found as an innovation team that that um, when we talk about pre-K to grade two, we really need to expand this to birth to grade two. We know how important the, um, the prior years are before our students start school. So you'll, you'll see some of that in, in our deliverables. Becky? So our first deliverable is community partnerships and family support. And we are very proud of what we have been able to accomplish so far this year and in that regard. We have created a welcome brochure for various community agencies that we plan to distribute. We also have created a pre-K kindergarten booklet for parents for their first school experience. We also have um, a pre-K kindergarten list of resources that um, we worked hand in hand with the Judy Center to create that. And this list will be distributed to all families for their first school experience. We do plan, whether a child qualifies for pre-K or not, to share the booklet and the resources with all families. So if a child does not qualify, they still will be receiving the list of resources so that they do have um, community supports that they can reach out to. We also have provided professional development to prior care partners. Susan has done a great job taking the lead with this. She um, has presented PD to Head Start. Um, and she also has held a kindergarten information night um, for KRA, our kindergarten assessment, which had a great turnout and was very, very successful in helping all of the daycares have an understanding of what students are expected to be able to do in kindergarten. So the second part of our um, deliverables is about school management of early childhood. Together as a team, we have revised some of the pieces of our pre-K and K registration process, um, especially the prior care piece. And I, I, I spoke to, to you about this, I believe, last month about prior care and how we are 
we have created a, a document so that we can really, really capture where our students are prior to kindergarten so that we can have that data to be able to reach out after our kindergarten readiness assessment so we know um, where we can provide the support that's needed. We're also working on creating an early childhood look for checklist, um, something that, that we'll create together with pre-K and K teachers to, to know what we are looking for as we walk into a classroom. We, we know that when students are playing, they're, they're not just playing, they're, there are lots of other things that are happening while they're in that process. Um, and the last thing, any information that comes to us, whether it is new information that comes from our State Department or other um, things that happen throughout the state, we want to make sure that we are able to get that to our, our elementary princi principals that have the early grades to make sure that they have um, what's new to be able to share that with their teachers as well. Any questions for us? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. We are uh, Innovation Team 3, Curriculum, Instructional Tools, and Assessment. Uh, my name is Rob Watkins. I am the Supervisor of Mathematics. I'm Bridget Passon, Supervisor of English Language Arts. Okay, so our first deliverable is a constant. It's ongoing. We are maintaining a committee comprised of key district instructional leaders, assistant principals, principals, fellow supervisors, and some teacher specialists, and so we're monitoring instructional models in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. We're also working to improve our, monitor, um, our monitoring tools. Um, and the first step we're taking there is to provide, uh, well, actually to produce a centralized data collection system. Um, this would be a platform where we would record informal observation as well as learning walk data, and it would be centralized. So all administrators, all supervisors would have access to it uh, in order to provide clear and consistent feedback across our great county. In turn, we're collaborating with Team 4. They are working really hard to create um, a standardized or a revised formal observation tool so that our teachers are getting even better, stronger feedback to help them improve their professional practice. Um, and so we want to make sure that the informal tool that we roll out, um, the format that we rolled out, absolutely aligns with that so, because our teachers deserve consistent feedback in both areas, informal and formally. The next thing we worked on is uh, a, an elementary school and middle school consistent schedule framework. So we examined the schedules of each of the buildings and looked at the best practices from around the state and around the country to try to figure out the exact amount of times that we should be teaching each of the contents for in elementary and middle school. Our primary focus was to maximize the core content instructional time to close the achievement gap and, and to create the opportunity for all kids to have academic success. Our team uh, delivered, and in, through work with um, Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, and the elementary and middle school principals, we examined and <coughs> delivered a framework that allowed us to get the, the schools, the, the revisor schedules going into next year to ensure that all, all students have access, equitable access to mathematics, reading, social studies, and science, as well as the unified arts. Working really hard to make sure that all students had the maximum amount of time allowable for those, uh, those contents. The second thing, uh, I guess the final thing we've been working on, and this is a, this is, this is a, a very large undertaking for, for our team. We, we have been working uh, very hard to examine and look at the feasibility of bringing a learning management system to our district. So we've, we've reached out to um, other districts who have incorporated this type of management system, and we were able to uh, bring in some consultants, excuse me, some, um, some vendors to help us understand what was out there. So uh, recently we, we, we spoke with Canvas, for instance, and they came in and showed us what a learning management system could be and provided us with a, m a mess of resources to really help us uh, understand how we could go about doing that. Our team's job is to look at a strategic <coughs> plan to, to see if this is something that fits our district and to lay out a, a framework of a plan for how we could adopt something like this in our district. So a learning management system essentially is a one-stop shop. It's a, it's a single sign-on process that, that puts all the curriculum materials and assessments in one location and uh, tries to utilize our technology to, the, uh, to its maximum ability. Do you guys have any questions for us? I, I just have one. Sure. How, why is it that I, in your framework of making all the elementary schools and middle school schedule the same, some schools have like a block for reading and is it English language arts and then some just have 
English language art. Like, can you explain to me why some middle schools would have two blocks and one, one wouldn't? So when I arrived two years ago, one of our schools was operating at just an English language arts block, and the other schools were operating at that split block, that reading and that language arts. With Common Core, dialing all the way back to 2013, there should have been a more consistent shift to one block because reading and writing hold hands. You can't do one without the other. And so some of the work that we started as we finished last year and rolled into this year was we asked the middle school principals to look at their schedules and see if they could take that shift with us in combining their reading and language arts blocks because we're working on curriculums that align more with college and career readiness standards. So that's why you've seen a shift. We have now worked this framework for our middle schools um, that three of our four middle schools will be operating at 65 to 72 minutes based on how their transitional times work. Um, and the curriculum that supports that will be park aligned with reading, writing, speaking, listening, language, all rolled in to a deliverable curriculum. And what is the benefit to either way? Like, is there, is there a benefit or, or a? Well, in the past, or historically, um, there was, it was easier to plan times for the reading teacher and the writing teacher to collaborate and make sure that what each was doing kind of aligned, and I think that's, that, that doesn't fit anymore. Um, so in looking at, you know, yes, we're tied to PARC, but PARC is an assessment that you have to read, you have to analyze text, and then you have to immediately write after it. So making sure kids are getting that exposure to accessing rigorous text and then writing to text immediately after, it's more of a benefit for them. Most of the other counties in our, in our state have made that shift and so we're just trying to make it as well um, and making sure that we're building a curriculum that really supports that. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good, Good evening. I'm Jackie Wilhelm, Principal Churchill Elementary School and the Project Manager for Innovation Center Team 4, Leadership in Professional Development. And with me this evening is Carrie Mitten. She's the Assistant Principal of Southersville Middle School and she is our Process Manager. And we are very excited to tell you about our first deliverable. When we were here in the fall, we were just starting to take on this project and we're very happy to say we're almost at the culmination. As Team 3 alluded to, alluded to, we have been working on revising our observation and evaluation documents. Uh, we haven't looked at them for probably a decade, and they needed some revision. There was some redundancy. We needed better alignment between our observation and our evaluation documents, and we have had a wonderful success working with both our administrators and supervisors and our teachers association to come up with a final product that everyone feels very confident about. So we have ready to submit it to the executive team for approval. We've shared it with all of our ANS staff. And the next step will be taking it to our Performance Matters platform. We actually, in the same time we've been working on revising the documents, we've been working with Performance Matters to get ourselves a new platform, which is uh, much more user friendly. The two are going to roll out in the fall. We are going to be training the administrators over the summer and we'll be monitoring that implementation as we start the next school year. We also, as you heard from Team 3, at the same time are working with them to help to align those informal documents and our walkthrough documents so we have seamless information for our teachers between all of our feedback. The, good evening. <laughs> the next uh, deliverable that we worked on um, that we're ready to submit uh, is the District Comprehensive Professional Development Plan. Uh, and the calendar I'm sorry the calendar and that um, it was determined by the district the calendar was set out we had to wait until that was approved and sent out once we did that we looked at our days and determined the schedule for the professional development days that has been submitted to the curriculum and instruction team uh, for their input and then it will be delivered to the executive team our next steps will be to look at the plan, um, kind of work with team one with that comprehensive district plan 
researching what other districts do and integrating it into our school improvement process. That'll be our next very large project very because large. it'll be a comprehensive professional development plan for the system. But we're very excited about what we've been able to accomplish and look forward to doing more work for you. And it didn't cost a penny. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Nice touch. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great evening. Hi, I'm Carol Camp, principal of Graysonville Elementary School. I'm the project manager for monitoring progress and performance. With me, Mr. Kevin Kintop, program director at APA, who serves as our process manager. Um, one of our big deliverables that we have worked on is that Mr. Kintop and Mr. Dave Brown met with teacher representatives at the elementary, middle, and high school to discuss testing times and purposes of testing at each grade level. Um, this was part of the More Teaching, Less Testing Act. And I'll have Mr. Kintop explain the agreement that we kind of came through that meeting. The uh, legislature has asked that we come to uh, meet and confer with our teachers when it comes to the percentage of testing that we're doing on a yearly basis. So Mr. Brown put together a very comprehensive uh, data sheet with pivot tables and everything with all the testing that goes on at each grade level. We met with the teachers at those grade levels, went over all the tests that he had listed as tests that are being administered as county directed tests. The teachers were able to ask questions, ask questions on the length of those tests, were the times correct, were tests mandatory or optional. We went grade by grade in every area. After we did that, all the questions they had, we took back to supervisors. The supervisors met, gave clarity and answers to those. We were then able to meet with the group again, go over all the final testing percentage times. They do not all fall under the 2.2 percentage, and that's a, just a piece that you need to know. They do not have to fall under 2.2 if the teachers are in agreement that being above is the percentage that they think is accurate for what they need for their teaching. So we met, we did each grade level, and we've met and conferred to the point where we're in agreement with the percentages at each grade level. So that is done and now ready for Dr. Cohen to submit <coughs> to the state that that part has been completed. Excuse me. Okay, we've also developed a rubric for evaluating any local assessments that are developed here in Queen Anne's County. And we've taken that rubric and we worked with our administrators and also our teacher specialists to have them field test the rubric with some of our current assessments to see what kind of feedback we could get on the tool that we had developed. We made revisions to the tool. We developed procedures for the use of the rubric. Um, we've also developed some guidelines for creating any future assessments that mirror the rubric that we wrote. And we hope that this rubric will be used this summer during any kind of curriculum writing that is done. We compiled a complete list of all the interventions that are currently being used throughout all of our schools in the county. And then we developed a rubric for making future decisions on interventions that will be used going forward. We want to make sure that we're making quality decisions on the interventions that we're using. The other thing that we have coming up in, in alignment with the, uh, the testing and assessment percentages is we're required to have a district committee that has representation of parents, teachers, administrators, and so forth. So we will be creating that committee, and that committee will be meeting regularly as designated by the, uh, the legislature so that we can be talking about how we're assessing kids on a regular basis and making adjustments to what's going on in the county uh, year by year. Any questions for, yes? The, uh, the rubric on um, uh, interventions that you're gonna you're gonna analyze each one with the results that and well, then I think decide. we're just thinking going forward with anything new that we look at um, the list is very extensive of what we have in this county but the new rubric really requires that any intervention be research and evidence-based so going forward I think those are the interventions that we'll be looking to purchase in the county because I think we can get the most bang for our buck with those kind of interventions.
and, and we are so creating the old, the old interventions because I some work and some don't. So they do, and sometimes you, once you're in intervention, you're in it for life. And we need to look at something that's going to help children make progress in reading, so that they're not in interventions. So we are inventing this rubric. This is not something that we're refining off of something else. We're creating this from scratch, and we're looking at things as like cost monitoring of students who are in it to know if they're meeting success success it will it match with the schedules that our schools have so the kids get the appropriate time for the intervention and all these things so once the rubric is in place it is designed so that as we evaluate new ones that we can use it but it will also let us make decisions on ones that have been here for 10 or 15 years and say let's look at this are we really getting quality out of it or is it time to put that one to rest and then move forward and then keeping the ones that were yes. seem to work. Okay, great, thanks. One thing I'd just like to add, Captain Kelly, to that. <coughs> and Mrs. Camp alluded to that, where you kind of see some cross-pollination between teams. The, the interventions that they collected, the reading interventions, then went to Mrs. Passon, and they had looked at all of our reading interventions. And one of the things that we found is that we're not exiting as many students as we should be in our interventions. So as Mrs. Camp mentioned, which nationally you see that as well, once kids get in intervention, they don't get out of intervention. So you'll see in the weekly update, we've been trying to provide you with an update on the Striving Readers Grant that Mrs. Passon and uh, Mrs. Walbert have been working on. So in that grant, which is about $1.6 million, is to systemically align our reading interventions all the way up from pre-K up and through high school. So we'll provide more information, but I think it's come out of this work that we've learned that we need to be more strategic in the interventions that we have and how we're using our resources to support students in their learning trajectory. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I would just like to recognize these leaders uh, for their work. Uh, I think you can see pretty quickly from just in 2016 uh, how much work has been going on um, in addition to their daily work. And I just publicly would like to recognize their leadership uh, and the work that they're doing with other individuals in our school system uh, to move this valuable work forward. And I think what everybody's realized out of this process is how a lot of these deliverables are interconnected. And what we're seeing in action is systemic improvement led by these individuals. Overall, I'll take any questions. If not, thank you for your continued support. And I echo your sentiment, Mr. Kaluski, and thanking those leaders and all of the teachers that they're working with in our, our teachers' union, um, and also for your leadership. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Carla Pullen, who's gonna speak with us about the Educational Facilities Master Plan. Good evening. Good evening. President DiMaggio, members of the board, and Dr. Kane. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the Facilities Planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I'm here tonight to lay out the process of the two-part funding cycle that's required when we ask for state participation in our construction or our building improvement projects. Some of you may recall this discussion from previous years, and typically we would bring this to you at our June meeting in preparation for submission of the document in early July. However, this year our July 4th holiday falls that first Wednesday of the month. So therefore, I'm gonna to strive to get your approval at the June meeting so that we can get that submission in on time. The purpose this evening is just to outline for you the document that you're going to be reviewing and the role of the Educational Facilities Master Plan in the state funding process, as well as to show you the schedule that we have for our funding process coming up. And 
after this evening we'll be providing an outline of the draft version of that educational facilities master plan so that we can request your approval on June 6th. The annual capital improvement program, our funding process is a two-step process. So we have first the educational facilities master plan. That's a wholesale look at Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And the second part of that is our capital improvement plan, and that is specific to our funding needs. So the educational facilities master plan, it's a long range plan that the state asks us to do every year. It looks at our programs, it looks at our buildings, it looks at the facilities that we have here in Queen Anne's County. We give yearly updates on new curriculum, on special needs, on any changes that may be happening in the demographics of our county. We review our enrollment projections. We look out 10 years and forecast what we anticipate will be happening in our enrollments that far out. We prioritize our facility needs. We look at the most important changes that need to happen to our buildings and what are the most urgent needs of the students. And then we outline necessary future projects. The state asks us to look ahead at what we foresee happening down the pike. The capital improvement plan, remember this is specific to the funding needs, is the second part of this process. It looks at the upcoming fiscal year, so what projects we'll be looking at for funding in fiscal year 2020. We project future years, so what do we see happening after fiscal year 2020. And then we'll establish a timeline for those future projects too. Again, here we prioritize our facility needs. Our facility assessment tool that we have that was completed two years ago is a fabulous tool for us. It helps us to plan out 20 years and look at what the life cycle expectancy is going to be for our buildings and all of the systems within. And then we outline our local and state funding needs as part of this CIP plan. If you remember, in the past, we had a 50% split. 50% of the funding came from the state. 50% of the eligible funding came from the county. We have been bumped up a little bit so that we have 51% of our funding coming from the state, and now 49 will be expected from the county. This next slide just outlines why the Educational Facilities Master Plan is required. It is required by state law. Until recently, this fell under the Board of Public Works, which establishes the Public School Construction Program. The Public School Construction Program requires the Educational Facility Master Plan. There were some new regulations that were just passed during this legislative session. There is going to be a change in the language and the authority of the Board of Public Works, and we are going to be giving back some of the approvals of the funding to the IAC, or the Interagency Commission on School Construction. It's gonna be an interesting change during our next uh, CIP process. If you'll recall, last fall I outlined um, the desire of the state to change the funding in priority of buildings per state, not necessarily per county, and this legislation is laying the framework for that as well. So we believe that our buildings will be prioritized against other buildings in the state. The components that were required to submit as part of the Educational Facility Master Plan, a cover sheet, the introduction, which introduces everyone to Queen Anne's County Public Schools, we look at our educational goals, standards, and guidelines, the mission of Queen Anne's County Public Schools, the vision, the core values, and the goals. There are applicable policies, the organization of our buildings per grade, transportation policies, and the policies on how redistricting or closing buildings and opening new buildings happens as well. We look at the enrollment projections, we also make sure that those projections are concurring with what the Maryland Department of Planning and the Queen Anne's County Department of Planning are seeing as well, so that there are three entities that have to come to some sort of agreement. We analyze the community in terms of demographics and how that is changing. We see migration trends for people coming in to the county and also leaving. And we look at the infrastructure of the county for future development, especially for residential development. 
the facility inventory looks at our current facilities as well as the districts that are outlined for each particular school. And then we look at the facility needs and the utilization. How much of a percentage is each building being utilized right now? And what do we think will happen for that in the future? Dates for our submissions. The Educational Facilities Master Plan that we're talking about tonight will be asking for approval at the June meeting. This has to be submitted to the state by July 1st. And then the Capital Improvement Plan follows a little bit later in the fall. In September, we'll be <coughs> back to discuss that with you. In September, uh, October, we'll be going for state submission on October 1st. And then the January, February timeline is when we normally start to talk <coughs> about our needs with the county government. Capital funding for construction with the county and state funding, the funds don't become available until July 1st of that fiscal year. But you will see that for planning and design, we will ask the county for advance funding, and it's usually one to two years in advance of a large project so that we can do design and planning for that. We've been given notice that next year, the state is looking at moving the timeline so that the Educational Facilities Master Plan and the Capital Improvement Plan are submitted at the same time. So next year, it's very likely that we'll be doing both of these plans for a July 1st submission but we don't have the new requirements on that just yet. Moving forward, these are our next steps. On May 18th, we want to make the draft plan available to you to start to review and to formulate any questions that you have for us. Right now, we have all of our community partners compiling their information. We'll get that together and submit to you by May 18th. On June 1st, we'd like to have some comments back to us so that we can prepare for the meeting and answer questions for you on June 6th. And then with any modifications that are necessary, we'll ask for that approval and then we will submit on June 29th to the state. Are there any questions that I can answer for you this evening? So we're going to see this in June even though it's not due till July, probably because of the holiday falling right. right there where our first meeting would be, and that extends that to the second week of July, so be ahead of the game? Correct. Perfect. Yes. Great. Thanks for that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gorsuch, did you want to give the um, monthly expenditure report? Yes. Um, it's, it's President DiMaggio, yeah, yeah. Superintendent Kane, and members of the board, you should have before you two uh, reports. The first uh, should be the one that uh, is one page, and it is the current expenditure report or expenditure status report by major category. And if you'll take a look at that, uh, there's only one major category where it looks like we may have to do a transfer. However, in talking to uh, Mr. Pender, we both agree that there probably is a coding area or coding issue there. So that will disappear once we find out what's, what's happening because it should not be overspent in that category. And as you can see, uh, the other category that Mr. Pender uh, supervises is operation of plant and it's well under at 88 percent of the budget so something got put in the wrong place so we will change that um, the second report shows those same categories broken down by what we call objects salary and wages contracted services supplies materials etc and as you take a look at that you'll see that within those objects these are the ones that we notify the county commission of any changes there will be some changes at your uh, June meeting where we will make those transfers uh, to keep those uh, objects aligned with one another within the categories. Uh, the only uh, real issue there is probably under special ed. Uh, there are a number of things there that uh, I'm trying to figure out exactly what's happening with that. If you notice the overall category though is still uh, under uh, within the category so there's no real problem with 
with that. But there is uh, some, something going on there in terms of some of the large expenditures. We know that under contracted services, that occurred because a lot of the services could not be, we could not employ people to do that, especially in OT, PT, and those kinds of services. So uh, they were contracted as opposed to salary. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to respond to those. I have one. The food services is zero. On, oh, is it? We yes, that's, that's held as a as really a that's carried here in the event that we might get state money uh, or something that we need to represent in the uh, on, in the on, yeah the um, uh, regular operating budget. But food services is held as a as a trust account, so it's held outside of the current expense budget. Because of where we get the money is, the, it's an in and out system where they pay for themselves, by and large, in terms of how they operate the program. So where is is the food services the well EXO? Where is that included? Then? Well, it wouldn't be included in the in the in this report, mm -hmm. just like the Title One grant wouldn't be reported here. Um, special funds and other kinds of grants and services wouldn't be reported here. They're reported in restricted accounts. So the, the money in food service that comes in can only be spent on food service, so it's considered, it's treated as a restricted account. Okay. If you want to see that sometimes, there's a pretty hefty <laughs> looking report that looks at all of those different restricted accounts and where we are in terms of expenditures, just like this, but they are not the, uh, the unrestricted budget. No problem. I just saw the zero there. No, it's a good question. I had it when I first looked at it, that same question. Thank you, Dr. Gorsuch. Um, at this time, um, the board would like to take a five-minute break. Um, so it is, uh, we will be back here. We'll take seven minutes. We'll be back by uh, <laughs> 7.55. Okay, welcome back from your little, oh, we did good. We only went one minute of our break. <laughs> of our break. <laughs> uh, let's see, at this uh, time, uh, the HR report, Mr. Farley. Uh, I would ask that the board approve in open session the uh, HR report as presented. I make a motion we accept the HR report as presented in closed session. I second the motion. All in favor say yes. 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 Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, where did that come from? I was like, what's going on? Good Lord. <laughs> All opposed, again, <laughs> Mr. Farley, I'm really sorry. <laughs> All opposed, no. <laughs> the eyes have it. <laughs> Look, I did get that right, didn't I? Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. So at this time, we will be going um, to, we are going to sign a tentative uh, agreement no, with the exterior door replacement. Yeah, we're going to move this. Oh, we're around. moving stuff around? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> confused. See, we're all confused here now. It's getting late. Um, at this time, we're going to sign the um, tentative contract for the teachers' union. Yep. Unit correct? One. That's correct. Uh, Ms. DiMaggio, if you could join me down here, we'll invite our, co our colleagues up and we'll ask uh, that we all Thank sign you. it. Thank you. Because I don't want to have a um, Yeah, that was a nice it, it may be ratified, but it's still subject to the fund. Of course, yeah. but it's okay. a ratified contract. Okay. We voted on it and it's been approved. We know that it's but, contingent but it on funding, but it is a ratified contract. <coughs> Did he have the tentative discussion there was more with than that? Funding in there. <coughs> you want to sign it? Do you want I have a pen, thank Okay, you. great. If you want to sign it Dr. King gave me hers. You want to sign on the side? Mm -hmm. or Hold on a second. <laughs> Mr. Farley, you might yeah. want to come up go here. Over to Mr. <coughs> I don't know. 600 and we have mm -hmm. two mil, and we don't. Mm -hmm. We're screwed. Let's 
her attorney. The son. Now to get that sign. Clarification is everything, isn't it? The details. But you know what? We didn't. I know. I hate getting information like two seconds before. I know. I'm kind of like, I guess I'll just probably get used to that because that seems like how it always. I have a question. Okay, Jen. Jen. Don't we have to amend the agenda? We didn't. Every single. It's not on the agenda. We had it on. Yeah, I took it off. Who took it off? Well, it was taken off until before we, we got here. Until we got here. Mm -hmm. We can just do it now. Uh, next. Next. Oh I don't know where Jack is going. So sorry. My dad went. I'll motion for that. You second. Because we didn't know that. <clears throat> We're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mindy. Mindy. Shut up. Oh, we got to start getting it off. I'm last because I'll mess up. Dean, you already signed it, right? Yes. She just wants to recognize that they need to bring and bread. Okay. Okay. But we didn't. That certificate of duty. Are we just getting so the Southern Soul Elementary School to do it? Okay. Right here. Do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to. I'm going to amend the agenda. Wait, okay. Doesn't. I'm going to move that we amend the agenda to reflect the signing of the tentative agreement with the certificated certificated unit one group, which has been ratified by the teachers, which has been ratified by the teachers union. Union and is tentative with us based on funding availability. I second it. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Okay, now we'll move on to the uh, SES exterior door replacement. Are you doing this, Sid? This oh, okay. okay. <laughs> do you just want to do the, the door and the roof all at one time, or? We can. Um, I have them as separate agenda items, but if you want me to combine them, I am happy to do so. Just do them back to one back. And okay. the other. Yeah, yeah, that's You're just fine. seeking approval, correct? That's correct. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Uh, for the record, I'm Carla Pullen, Facilities Planner with Queen Anne's County Public Schools. The first request for approval is for the construction contract for the replacement of the exterior doors at Sudlersville Elementary School. This project will include just about all of the doors on the outside of the building. The exception is several doors that were replaced very recently uh, on the historic portion of the building. They still have a very good life expectancy. We received three bids for the project. The low bidder is Overhead Door Company of Baltimore. They have a very good reputation and very good references doing the exact same work with Anne Arundel County Public Schools, Howard County Public Schools, and Caroline County Public Schools. We are requesting 
that we accept alternate number one, which will not only replace the doors, but the door frames at all of the openings as well. And since the funding is available, that will just assure that since we're going to the extent of it replacing the doors, the frames are not giving out too quickly. The available funding for the project is 230000 and we're requesting approval for the contract amount of $161,269. Are these uh, um, school year 17, 18? Yes. <coughs> and the capital project. Yes, okay. correct. Thank you. Both of them. Yes, for both of them. Yep. I make a motion that we approve the SES exterior door replacement as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The second project for approval is a construction contract for the partial roof replacement at Settlersville Elementary School. This is the low slope roof over the kitchen area, over classrooms that are adjacent to the cafeteria and gymnasium, and over the media center. We received four bids for this project. The low bidder is Ron Ruff Roofing. We worked with Rough Roofing recently on the same type of replacement at Kennard Elementary School. They were a great group to work with, fast, efficient, on time, on budget. Uh, this project, as with all of our state funded projects, must go to the IAC, which is part of the Public School Construction Program. Uh, we expect their approval in May, so work on both projects will begin as soon as students are out of the building. We're recommending for this project that we accept alternate number one as well, which is an Energy Star rated coating. It's a lighter reflective surface, will help with energy consumption. Available funding for this project is 323000 and we're requesting approval of the contract amount of $285,060. Um, Ms. Paul and I have one question that. Um, yes. I you have roof roofers and run roof roofers, so. Um, is it the same company that? It is not the same company. Right. They are brothers okay. who compete in the market, same marketplace together. Okay, thank you. I make a motion that we approve the SES roof contract as presented. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Um, before we move on to future action, <coughs> excuse me, future action, action items, I can't even get it out. Um, I'd like to uh, state a resolution that the board has um, decided. Uh, whereas during the week of April 9th, 2018, one or more incidents of student misconduct occurred involving athletes at Ken Island High School. The incident, which resulted in various allegations, investigations, and other responses by administrators and law enforcement. <clears throat> Whereas during the investigation, social media attention and other follow-up activity, the board became aware that one of its members, Beverly Kelly, has a direct personal interest in the matter. Whereas Captain Kelly eventually acknowledged said personal interest and recused herself from proceedings before the board, effective April 18, 2018. Whereas other board members have since learned that Captain Kelly has engaged in certain actions related to the incident, both before and since her recusal, which call into question her ability to act impartially, ethically, and in a manner consistent with her duties as a board member. These actions include communicating with school administration, possibly the parents about something, undermining the functioning of the board and or the superintendent of schools in addressing the incident and failing to inform interested parties and other members of the public about her recusal from the Queen Anne's County Public Schools promptly and board proceedings involving the incident. Whereas members of the Board of Education must hold to the highest standards of conduct 
and leadership in fostering an environment within Queen Anne's County Public Schools community where student misconduct, misconduct is investigated and administered in a fair and equitable manner. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the, the Board of Education hereby formally expresses its displeasure and disapproval of Captain Kelly's actions. The board hereby declares that Captain Kelly's actions have impaired the functioning of the board as a body and has negatively impacted operation of the school system. The board hereby publicly censors Captain Kelly for these actions and the board expresses its belief that Captain Kelly should resign and farther that if she does not resign, the board will consider other possible action, including a formal but not limited to request to the Maryland State Board of Education to remove Captain Kelly from her position as a local board member for the statu statutory cause. I, I move to accept the resolution. Discussion? Yes, I have a... I have no intention of resigning from my position as a member of Queen Anne's County Board of Education. That's fine, Captain Kelly. That's not what we're here to discuss. So we've had, um, although I was not required to recuse myself from issues related to the Kent Island High School lacrosse program, I chose to recuse because I've been friends with many of the players and their families for many years. I chose to recuse myself in order to avoid conflicts of interest or the appearance of impropriety or bias in any review or follow-up actions that might result. I was elected by a majority of Queen Anne's County residents to fulfill the duties and responsibilities of an elected member of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education and have and will continue to perform these duties to the best of my abilities for the duration of my term. We have a motion. I need a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. At this time, we will move on to... Um, in, in keeping with that, Dr. Kane, could we get, like, an update about where we are in the investigation process? No names, no parties involved, just, like, how close are we to concluding this? Um, how much longer can we expect it to move on? Um, just an update for the community and ourselves of where we are in the process. Certainly. So, as you know, the um, Sheriff's Office is conducting an investigation side by side uh, with us. We have interviewed several, and when I say we, I mean the school administration, because I don't interview or investigate, nor does Mr. Pender, although Mr. Pender uh, oversees the investigation at Queen, uh, Kent Island High School. Several students have been interviewed. Several of the uh, coaches have been interviewed. Um, and what we're finding is that parents are coming forward with more information, which creates an opportunity for us to investigate what they have said. So whereas many people in the public may think that this is going on for far too long, it is because we have to respond to any allegation that a parent presents to us. So I've gotten two additional ones within the last week. And so we have to, again, interview those folks that are involved with that. So as we continue to get more information, we have to investigate it. So that has prolonged this whole procedure. Um, and we will, we have committed to investigating fully each allegation. And so it has taken a bit of time that we didn't um, expect. And uh, I, I may also put out there, as they have every right to do so, the Sheriff's Office has subpoenaed our investigation records, um, which would probably become part of their investigation. So this is not, I don't anticipate that it's going to take uh, to the end of the school year for certain, but as we get more information, we have to investigate it. So that prolongs it. So our investigation internally, not unusually so, is still ongoing. It is. But that has nothing to do with what the sheriff does or what anybody else does, correct? Well, we're doing... We, our we do our investigation, our but like I said, we our records are subpoenaed, so we'll have until sometime third week, I believe, in May to turn over the investigation records that we have to that point, um, and we will do so uh, gladly. Okay. Thank 
Okay. Okay, so now we will move on to policies for the first read. Mr. Farley. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so policies for the first read would be the Department of Transportation or DOT drug and alcohol policy number tw uh, 250. Uh, this policy simply brings current uh, those federal requirements that we're obligated to implement and we will put this out for public feedback. We also have Miss uh, Helen White from uh, White's Club. <clears throat> white glove drug and alcohol testing that uh, works with us and has helped develop uh, this if you have any questions she is here to answer any questions were there any questions no, no. may have a motion to approve the DOT drug and alcohol policy policy number 250 to go to our stakeholders for a first read so moved Becca. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Then we move on to textbook adoption. Madam President, this is a request. 9.02 is a textbook adoption request for 30 day review for high school mathematics, probability, and statistics. Any questions? I just have one question. None of these books are consumables, are they? No, and Mr. Watkins is here if we've got any of those. No, it is not. In fact, uh, if I remember correctly, Mr. Watkins, how old is the current text? Is it 25 years old? Oh, there is no current textbook. No current. <laughs> <laughs> That's even worse than 25 years old. The abacus. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... This is a course that we, that we are using standards based uh, from, from Common Core to kind of deliver and we are using open resources currently. Uh, we feel that, uh, that we are trying to grow our probability and statistics program and we feel that this resource is needed to grow that program. It's uh, the resource is in alignment with where we think our kids need to go entering a college level co uh, statistics course. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? They have a motion to allow the HS Mathematics Probability and Statistics textbooks to be available for a 30-day review. So moved. moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Uh, moving on to the Citizen Advisory Council discussion. I'd like to... Um, motion that we examine the possibility of creating a citizen advisory committee that works directly with the board and the community. Um, I think that might be an integral part in getting all of our committee groups kind of in the same direct going in the same direction. Um, generally the other counties have something of this this type. Um, chosen by the board from the community input you know people who offer to serve and working directly with the board and the entire system to maybe address concerns um questions just a little bit more of a open line of communication than having to stand in line and kind of wait for a callback or something to that effect that we would meet with them maybe at the same time every month during a meeting they would bring forward their things and give us a heads up what they are so we could have answers ready for them as soon as they present their questions and we would seek um, the community to be a part of this um, stakeholders parents business owners don't have to have children in the system we're all taxpayers so anybody would be welcome to um, join us for this committee and I'd like to motion that we do this I second the motion I just have a question you have some advisory committees um, does I that do. cover I do but no most districts have and I, probably all districts have a citizens advisory committee and that would be outside of the superintendent's advisory okay mm -hmm. But working you, with, but you had a alone. parent involvement. I do. In I have a, I have a parent advisory. I have a student advisory and a staff advisory. Right, right. And probably more on the horizon. 
hopefully business next year. There you go. And there I think that this, uh, the board would be more involved with this particular Yeah, it would one. be, um, we would choose the people, but we hope not to turn anybody down. But if we get a thousand applicants, of course, we've got to turn somebody down. And um, they would report to us and, and just kind of, you know, not come to us to, to answer anything sensitive, but when they have a concern about how, how something works, and we would not act as experts. We would get the experts to answer those questions for them so that maybe that flows a little quicker for them instead of kind of trying to guess where to go to find this information. Um, not everybody really does understand our website, which is under construction and we're working on, but there's just a lot of people who don't have a clue where to start looking for something in particular and maybe we could guide them in that direction we can mix a whole lot of different topics into the into the mix it's not going to be significant to one or two things and you probably want to give them an opportunity to have a section in the monthly board meeting so that they can report out sure. absolutely that's sure. a great idea dr mm -hmm. Kane. sure yep, yep. Motion in a second. Okay, so all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Um, at this time, is there anyone that did not get to speak at the beginning that would like to speak now? Okay, Ms. Karen Fields, come on up. Good evening. Um, this is a little disappointing this evening. Actually, it's very disappointing. I have my negotiating team here. We came here to sign a contract that was ratified by our members. There's no need for us to sign a tentative agreement. Mr. Pippo and Mr. Farley agreed to the contents of that tentative agreement. That's why we sent it to all our members and asked that they vote on it this week. They voted on it this week. It therefore becomes a ratified contract. So there was no reason for me to ask people who already give up a lot of their time to come here and sign something that we've already agreed upon. We, we gathered these people together to sign a ratified contract. So I don't know where the miscommunication was, but that's why we were here. And it's extremely, extremely disappointing. Mrs. Fields, we did put it in air. Um when we voted on it, it was ratified by teachers. But then it, becomes, we, then it becomes a contract. What I signed tonight was a tentative agreement. I should have been signing a contract. Yeah, that's how we used to do it. So I, I yeah. don't understand it. If you can explain it to me, I'd like to understand. But that's why Mr. Farley, one of the names of the people that were negotiating, because it's, you know, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of thought, and I wanted those people to be here because they were part of that process. But to sign something that doesn't need to be signed because it was already agreed to makes no sense to me. You know, members, all but one person who voted, voted no for that contract. And to come here tonight and sign a document that really doesn't mean anything because it should be a ratified contract is very disturbing to me and I'm sure to to our members let us um, talk about this after um, the meeting please we'll sure. talk to mr. Farley and uh, and we'll get back to you okay okay thank you, thank you. anyone else okay so we're going to move on to future meetings and events and uh, May 3rd uh, which is tomorrow 2018 legislative session what your board needs to know um, that's being done by Mabe May 16th we will have a school board work session beginning at 11 a.m. May 17th nurses pinning ceremony at Queen Anne's County High School and that begins at 6 p.m. May 21st National Honor Society Superintendent's Luncheon, 11.30 to 12.30 at Annie's Paramount Steakhouse. Um, May 23rd, Visual and Performing Arts Recognition at the Kennard Elementary School, 6 to 7.30 p.m. May 31st, Ken Island High School Commencements, which begin at 5.30 p.m. And on June 1st, I'm going to cry, Queen Anne's oh. County High School oh, Commencement. Oh, oh, oh. 7 p.m., which is my baby. 
Um, June 6th, school board meeting. June 18th, the annual Eastern Shore Superintendents and Board Members Education Conference, and that will be held from 8.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. at the Chesapeake College, the EHEC Center, Room 110. June 20th, the school board, school board work session and July 11th, school board meeting. meeting. Um, does anyone want to discuss anything else at this time? I, I just have one thing. Um, the teacher gala, I just, it, it was fabulous, and we didn't really say a lot about that. It was, I think, best we've ever had, and I've been to a lot of those galas. Really enjoyed it myself, and um, Carrie was there, and, and uh, Sharon. So it was, was really it? worth, oh, wait, weren't you there? Oh, no, I was sitting next to someone who looked just like you. <laughs> so, but anyhow, it was really a great event, and I just want to thank the folks who planned it. Um, and did the thank the you, hard Captain work. Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, we also received several comments that it was one of the best that they'd had. Uh, there was one member of our community who was also a, a business partner said he's been going to them for 30 years, and it was the best one he'd attended. It was a wonderful facility. Everybody was in a festive mood, and our employees and our teachers. We just could not say enough about them. So thank you. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. I do believe the ayes have it. Good night. Right. <laughs>